And so Bernoulli's equation, we've been talking about variation of pressure with depth. And I was looking at uh, everybody's worksheets yesterday. Uh, most people, you get the idea, just be very careful. One of the things that I noticed some of you do and you don't seem to think about it is you're adding what you know, people talk about adding apples and oranges, which you can't do. Whatever unit of pressure you choose to work a problem in, everything you add together must have the same units of pressure. In this course, my general recommendation is to go to Newton per meter squared or a Pascal. The reason is because if you want to get a force out of that, it's really easy. You just multiply by an area in meters squared, a Newton per meter squared, a force, I'm sorry, a pressure times meters squared, the meters squareds cancel and you're left with a unit of force in Newtons. I saw a number of people taking atmospheres of pressure and multiplying by a meter squared, thinking you're getting a Newton and you're not. Okay, an atmosphere is not a Newton per meter squared. Similarly, I saw people using atmospheric pressure in units of atmospheres and adding to it the density times the acceleration due to gravity times the, the distance, the height, which will give you pressure in Newton per meter squared. And then they were just adding those two things. Well, you can't add pressure in atmospheres to pressure in Newton per meter squared. So think about what people say colloquially that you can't add apples and oranges. Make sure you're in the same unit. And then if you want to get force out of a pressure, you absolutely have to get to Newton per meter squared to Pascal. And I didn't do it. <laughs> I'm not the person that came up with what, five, six different units I can think of for pressure. Um, I, I would have stayed with one, but these things developed over time. Pressure is one of those phenomena that has just been around forever. And so different people in different disciplines want to use different units. And that's just the way it is. And, and we have to adapt. Medical people seem to like millimeters of mercury, as you saw in the blood pressure uh, lab yesterday. And you got to convert that to Newton per meter squared to make any sense of it with the, the, the gauge pressure rho, the density times G times H. One other thing I saw people doing, don't confuse pressure P with the Greek rho density. I saw a number of people doing that on the worksheets too. So be careful for those mistakes. If you can keep the quantities in fluids straight, it's a fairly easy discipline uh, to work in. I mean, we're only spending four lectures on it. I actually took a course as an undergraduate in fluid physics. It's not that hard a course um, if you can keep all the symbols and the units straight. Don't confuse pressure with density. All right, any questions on that? All right, so I'm going to move on to Bernoulli today. We also, on Wednesday, we talked about, um, about buoyancy, okay? And again, you got to play with that density term. Uh, so we, we looked at that. And we also talked about uh, moving fluids for the first time. And we're going to do more of that today. Bernoulli's equation is all about fluids moving. That could be wind unconstrained in the atmosphere. It also could be a fluid moving through like a pipe a garden hose, something like that. And the first thing I want to share with you is what we did say on Wednesday about moving fluids. All right, I don't, maybe I'm in the wrong place here. What did I share? I didn't see the, I, to give me confidence, I, you know, I bet I did the whole desktop rather than just the PowerPoint. There, now I see the border, which tells me you're seeing my PowerPoint screen. And in this case, the fluid, Fluids, remember, are either gases or liquids constrained in some kind of pipe. Pipe looks like a bottle. It, it continues off to the left uh, at that wide uh, uh, cross-sectional area, that wide diameter. I'm sorry, off to the left with the wide diameter. Off to the right, it narrows down and it continues on as a narrower pipe off to the right. But hopefully what you see right here is this little, people refer to things like slugs, that little slug right there that has some cross-sectional area A1 and some, um, some width. Delta X, Delta X is suggestive of the fact that we velocity in a second. You can see if that amount of the fluid transitions to the right into the narrow part, well, that same amount has to kind of spread out with a little bit bigger X2, Delta X2, right? 
it'll be still be the same volume because we say fluids are incompressible, uh, at least in our class. Those of you who are chemists know gases aren't very incompressible, but we're going to always keep them incompressible because uh, it suits us. And that amount of, of that water right there or whatever the fluid is has to kind of change shape to look like that. But the point, I guess, is the volume has to pass through the pipe at the same rate. Okay, and since X2 got bigger compared to X1, that means it must be moving faster over here on the right than it was over here on the left. Okay, so we came up with the continuity equation, which conserves the volume. And since we're incompressible, it also conserves the mass, which is flowing through the pipe at any time. We said that the cross-sectional area times the velocity at that point, which is just delta X divided by a time interval, has to be equal to the cross-sectional area where it gets narrower times the velocity where it gets narrower, which is just that delta X divided by the same time interval. We call that the continuity equation. It governs flow of a fluid through a pipe system like this, where you can actually measure the cross-sectional areas. Remember, pi times a radius squared is the cross-sectional area of a circular pipe. If it's a square pipe, which is allowed, you just take a length times a width. Um, be careful, sometimes we'll give you a diameter. Remember, you got to divide a diameter by two in order to get a radius, in order to get a cross-sectional area. In any event, the symbol we use for volumetric flow rate, the number of cubic meters per second, is this Q. Why we pick Q when we've just finished using Q for heat in the energy chapter is, again, one of the mysteries of life for me as well. Who picked that? Couldn't we have come up with a different symbol? And I'll tell you in other disciplines, there is a different symbol uh, for it, but it, it has a calculus-like notation. And so in, in PHY 101, we, we're looking for a better symbol. It doesn't look like something out of calculus, okay? So in any event, we're stuck with it. That's what it is. Bernoulli's equation now, the next uh, piece of this moving fluid, it actually is a conservation of energy equation. Bernoulli was a physicist who knew about conservation of energy. And we're going to ignore heat, because that would be confusing, having two Qs in the same equation. So we're going to ignore that. We're going to ignore thermal energy. Okay, And we'll pick that up a little bit when we come back from Thanksgiving break. We'll talk about viscosity, which is basically friction uh, with walls of the pipe, the fluid in the, the walls of the pipe. But And we'll I, I say chemical energy. We're not going to do any chemical energy. I hope I didn't lose my train of thought there. So all we're going to have is what people refer to as mechanical energy, kinetic energy and potential energy. And that change in energy is equal to the work done. Well, hopefully you can see that as a fluid moves through a pipe, water through a garden hose, air through one piece of Tygon tubing, whatever it is, it has kinetic energy, which might change as it moves through a, a system. It has potential energy too, as I've kind of Taking this pipe, not only did I make it thinner, I also made it go up in height. So there's a change in potential energy. And well, what causes the fluid to move in the first place? There's a force at one side pushing. There's always a force pushing back, but if it's going to move this way, F1 has to be greater than F2. And so we look at the work done by F1 and the work done by F2. And, and you may ask, well, what's the, where's the force coming from? The answer is it's coming from pressure times an area, just what I said at the start of class, pressure in Newton per meter squared, force over an area, times the cross-sectional area, whatever the pressure is right here, and there will be some at point one, multiplied by the cross-sectional area of the pipe, and that's the force F1. There'll be some pressure on the other side too, we'll call it P2. It has to be less if the fluid is moving, as I show here, left to right, uh, but it pushes back. Okay, and so we look at the work done by those forces. Force times the displacement has been work since chapter 10. And this force over here, because the fluid is being displaced to the right, is a positive amount of work. This force over here, because the fluid is moving to the right, but the force is to the left, is a negative amount of work. And that's why we subtracted it right here. Okay, so change in kinetic energy change in potential energy is equal to the work done by the pressure, which is the motive force to move the fluid through the pipe in the first place. By the way, uh, if those of you who've taken a meteorology class or, or thought about it, you see these weather maps where the, what the meteorologist will show you, here's the high pressure region, 
Here's the low pressure region, usually H and L on maps of the United States. Hopefully you realize that is a difference in two pressures. And if you're kind of thinking about what the gross direction of the wind flow is going to be, it's going to be from the H to the L, from the higher pressure to the lower pressure. That's what causes air to move, and we call it wind. Okay, Meteorology 101, I probably exhausted everything I know about meteorology right there. All right, um, so what do you do with this energy equation? And, and this should look a whole lot like chapter 10. Well, I went through last night in a pre-lecture video. What you do is you divide by volume. You divide volume away. You remember, density is a mass times a volume. So I can write a mass as a density times a volume. I can write a mass as a density times a volume. Density, not a pressure. That's a Greek row. See the little tail here? Is equal to a mass divided by some volume. And we're calling the volume delta V here. That tells us that the mass is equal to the density times the volume. So we put that in every place here. Okay, and oh, by the way, this change in potential energy term that I haven't said too much about, okay, it's just because of a change vertically. Remember, a delta Y is always a Y final minus a Y initial. Okay, so that actually just like this is has a subtraction, there's a subtraction right here too. And of course, there's a subtraction right there between the work being done. Okay, any event, we did exactly what I said before with force, it became a pressure times an area. And then notice that right there, an area times that displacement, that's a volume too. And so I can divide all those volumes away. And I'm left with something that looks like the change in kinetic energy. But instead of mass, I got volume. I'm sorry, mass per volume. I got density. Okay, so instead of one half mv squared, final minus initial, I have one half rho v squared, rho being mass over volume. Okay, I've got a change in potential energy. But instead of having mass here, I got mass per volume. So it's a change in potential energy per volume. And then I just have a difference in pressure. That's the motive force that's causing all this to happen. It's convenient to use density instead of mass in a fluid, if you think about it. When you have an object, a block on an inclined plane, it's really easy to identify the object, identify the mass, right? Hey, just look at it. There it is. You can put it on a scale. When you've got a continuous flow of, of some kind of fluid going through a pipe, what do you identify as the mass? What do you take out of the pipe and put on a scale and how could you? And the answer is you can't. All you can do is talk about how the mass is distributed throughout the volume and that's why we use density. So there's Bernoulli's equation for fluid flow. I'm gonna do a problem in a bit and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll show you uh, I actually have a, a better way to write Bernoulli's equation. For me, it's a little easier to memorize and learn and think about even. If, even if you have to look at a, an equation sheet to, to do it, for me, it just helps me conceptualize a problem and see if you like it my way. You can always use what's right here on the equation sheet. But for now, we'll move on and I'll do what I always do. If there's, unless there's any questions, we'll ask, we'll ask some questions of you then. And let me see, get to, th there's the first one. I think I have four today, if I remember right. Yeah, this is, are you, are you aware of what we're talking about today is kind of this equation. Is everybody out there? We're awake. Yes. Good. All right. 19 to 22. Waiting for three more. I'm done with this poll, though. Pretty straightforward. We're talking about Bernoulli's equation today. Continuity equation does not contain pressure. All it is is velocities and cross-sectional areas. Bernoulli's equation is where we bring in the pressure aspect, okay? And so the answer is C, Bernoulli's equation today. Let's move on to the next one. And for all of you thinking of taking the, oh, I didn't put the, the number up there at the top. 
blood flows through an artery. You get to be old like me. You get this calcification or whatever clotting here uh, narrows down the, the, the artery or the vein, I guess. Where's the speed the greatest? And this is a continuity equation issue, right? And that's why I think most people are getting it right because we've talked about this for two days now. All right, I got most everybody in and we've been going about a minute. So I'm gonna end it, share the results. And yeah, absolutely. Uh, if where the area is big, which would be right here, right? And I'm thinking about there's that cross-sectional area there. There's a cross-sectional area right there where the area is small, the velocity must get bigger in order to have continuity of volume flow. So absolutely, A is the right answer. Good work. Move on to the next one. And now we're going to bring Bernoulli into the picture, I think. Because now, same thing. But in this case, the platelet here has gone from the narrow part to the wide part. Why we didn't go from the wide part to the narrow part, I don't know. I didn't write the question. Blood platelet drifts along as the platelet moves from the narrow part to the wide part. Its speed, actually, we haven't gotten to Bernoulli yet, have we? Continuity again. All right, ending it. So I can get you moving here. Everybody saw decreases. Yeah, it's just the exact inverse of the situation I asked on the previous problem. So yeah, absolutely see it slows down when it gets to the wider part again. And I, I guess that just, the, the point of the two problems together is there is continuity from this point to this point to this point in terms of the mass which is moving by in the blood or the volume of the blood which is moving by, okay? And so that little platelet is gonna have to speed up as it goes through that narrowing part. We'll stop sharing that and move on to the last one. which is this. Now we've got Bernoulli in. Okay, so we're going from the block part to the unblocked part. What happens to the pressure? I mean, one or the other here. All right, this is the one people have to think about. We don't have to worry about a change in potential energy, right? There's no height changes here. I mean, maybe a small one right there, I guess, but we ignore that. The height is not changing for this artery, I guess, is what we're doing here. Call this point two, call this point one. I got 17 folks in thinking about it. All right, we're gonna end it here because we're kind of split 50-50 on the answer. It's either gonna rise or, 
or drop, right? One or the other. I'll tell you a rule that I know that I've just learned. And you could either choose to learn the rule or you can choose to figure it out from Bernoulli's equation each time, up to you. But one of the rules is where the velocity is fast, the pressure is lower. And where the velocity is lower, like we have right there, the pressure must be greater. It's just a rule. Now let's use Bernoulli to kind of make it make sense of it. I've labeled my two points one and two here. And hopefully I got Bernoulli's equation correct because I hate this formulation of it. I, I'll show you the one I prefer when uh, I move right next after this to solving a problem for you. But at two here, it's going slower. Okay, so velocity two is less. So this term is less than point one where it's moving faster. So overall, I think this is a negative number, right? I'm taking a smaller, a slower velocity, squaring it, multiplying it by the density. The two densities are the same. It's the density of blood. We said yesterday in the lab, it's about 1,060 kilogram per meter cube. So those two densities are the same. Okay, so if this is negative, which pressure is greater? And the answer you can see in order to make it negative, P2 would be greater, okay? And so that's why I think it is going to experience a pressure rise because it's going from the low pressure region to a higher pressure region when it's moving slower. You know, I kind of look at the continuity equation and I look at velocities and I go, well, where it's narrower, it's going faster. Where it's wider, it's going slower. And then I have the same rule in my head for, uh, for pressures. Where it's narrower and going faster, the pressure is lower. And where it's wider and going slower, the pressure is higher. But Bernoulli's equation uh, works that all out for you. All right, either a rise or a drop. In this case, when you go from a narrow channel to a wider channel, the pressure rises. So it is B. Questions on any of that? And, and we'll work it through with numbers here because, I mean, that for me puts the icing on the cake, I guess. And so I'll stop sharing this unless there's any questions. And I'm gonna go over to my uh, iPad and work a problem and show you what I mean about a, a different formulation of Bernoulli's equation that to me makes just a little more sense than what were shown in our textbook and on my slides in my pre-lecture video. And you can do either one. They're perfectly equivalent. All right, so I need to do screen mirroring. All right, look at that, it works. And hopefully you're seeing the first problem and it's problem zero. So that's the one I get to do. And so you got water flowing steadily in the pipe and it's going left to right. You know, I try to always go left to right because that's the way we read, right? And so it just kind of helps people out a little bit. The velocity over at point one there, two meters per second. The diameter at that point is six centimeters. And the diameter over at point two is two centimeters. And then the other thing that you can see is, and I didn't put it in the problem statement, but it's on the diagram. This pipe not only narrows, but it goes through a 10 meter change in height from point one to point two. And we'll just assume it's fresh water in there, a thousand kilograms per meter cubed. And you know we wanna figure out some things like what's the velocity at point two? What's the difference in pressure between points one and two? And then the rest of the problem hopefully will give you some insight into what we call gauge pressure and why, because this right here is an old fashioned pressure gauge. I think the pressure at point one is, let's see, it's gonna be a little higher because the fluid is moving a little slower there, I expect. And so you can see that back in the day, people would put some fluid like mercury in a tube like that, that's shaped like a U, it's called a U-tube, measure the height difference and infer from that what the gauge pressure must be using the equation rho times G times D is equal to a pressure difference, okay? And so that's the, the nature of the word. That, those things were called U-tube manometers. 
You may still see them in laboratories occasionally, but we're a little more sophisticated with pressure gauges these days, okay? We've got uh, digital pressure gauges and you don't necessarily see the U-tube with the, uh, the fluid in it any longer, but they exist. So it's kind of a comprehensive problem. I, uh, I've used it in the past on exams. I should just warn you about that, but uh, well, let's work through this thing. But before I actually crank out the numbers, I wanna show you a different formulation for writing Bernoulli's equation that to me makes a whole lot of sense. And in order to do that, I wanna start with chapter 10 and a little bit of review from that, right? And we've said, uh, get the pen tool to work, the change in energy is equal to the work done, in chapter 10. And I'm gonna, no Q, change, no heat, right? No thermal energy changes. Okay, uh, no chemical energy changes, which simplifies the problem significantly, shortens everything up for you. So what's the only thing that can change? Well, what we started off with Bernoulli's, kinetic energy can change, potential energy can change. Remember, we got two types. We got gravitational and spring potential energy, and that's equal to the work done, right? Okay, um, let's think about what the change in kinetic energy is. Let's think about what the change in anything is. Okay, and so that would be kinetic energy final minus kinetic energy initial. And let's not allow any springs. So we'll say spring potential energy is also equal to zero. Okay, it is a type of mechanical energy, which is really what's left over after we take away heat, we take away thermal energy, we take away chemical energy. What we left, what we have left is what people refer to as mechanical energy, which is kinetic and potential energy. So let's only talk about gravitational potential energy. Let's no, put no springs in this problem. And so that is, let's see, final potential energy, gravity, mgy, right? m times g times the height, minus the initial is equal to the work done. And so what I like to do with this is write something like one half the mass times the final velocity squared. And final might be 0.2 minus one half the mass times the initial velocity squared plus the mass times the acceleration due to gravity times the final height, again, might be two for the final, minus m times g times y initial. That's the potential energy change. That's supposed to be an i. Well, that's a lousy looking i. is equal to the work done, okay? And, and for me, this is a useful way to write this. And we did one time write it this way. We said then that one half, get the pen tool back, one half the mass times the final velocity squared. So I'm taking that term, take that one as well, plus the mass times the gravitational uh, acceleration times the final height, and now everything that was negative before, I'm gonna to move to the other side of the equation with the work done. Okay, so that's equal to one half the mass times the initial velocity squared plus the mass times the acceleration due to gravity times the initial height plus any work you do. For me, this is a, a very sensible way to look at conservation of energy. It says what I started with in terms of energy, that's kinetic energy and potential energy. And by the way, if you had a spring, just add that in as well. Okay, so the energy I start with, plus any work I do, leaves me with the energy that I finish with. That's the most sensible construction or construct of, of conservation of energy for me. What I start with has to be what I finish with, plus any work I added on, or maybe took away. Right? So for me, this is a very sensible way to do conservation of energy problems. We talked about it a little in, um, in chapter 10, but we didn't make a big deal out of it. But if you watch me work problems, that's how I like to work them. Okay, so now let's think about what's going on in Bernoulli's equation. All right, we've got something like one half the density, not the mass, times the velocity, and it's final again, 0.2 if you like, 
F is equal to 0 0.2, initial is equal to 0.1. That's logical. You go from one to two, okay? Um, plus, well, let's, let's write it the way our textbook writes it, and then I'll put it in the form that I think is better. Uh, minus one half the density times the initial velocity squared. Okay, then the book we said plus the density times G times the change in height is equal to um, P1 minus P2. That, that's the equation that I gave you for Bernoulli's equation, for Bernoulli. All right, well, I would argue, why not break this thing up right here into final minus initial, just like I've been doing. And if you like ones and twos, go back to that. Okay, and then recraft it a little bit and bring everything that's final to one side of the equation, bring everything that's initial to the other side of the equation. And maybe I should be consistent here. Um, one would be initial, right? Two would be final over on the pressure side. And so I might say something like one half the density times the final speed plus Let's use that one right there, density times G times Y final. And then let's bring this guy to the other side of the equation plus pressure final. And now look, don't, don't make the mistake I talked about. These two guys are Greek rows, okay? This is a pressure. I saw a couple of people confusing those. That's gotta be equal to bring this thing and this thing to the other side of the equation, one half, one half, not one over row, one half the density times the initial speed squared plus rho times G times the initial height plus what's already over there, the initial pressure. And so for me, this tells me that the initial kinetic energy per volume plus the initial potential energy per volume because density is mass per volume, density is mass per volume, plus the pressure at the start has to be equal to the final kinetic energy per volume, plus the final potential energy per volume, plus the pressure at the end. And in the same way that I, uh, I'd argued that initial energy plus work done is equal to final energy, I'm making the same argument here. Initial energies per volume plus the pressure I do is equal to the final energies, the kinetic and potential, plus the final pressure, all right? And so that's the way I prefer to, to solve the problems and choice is yours, which you wanna use. All right, with time to get down to numbers and, and work some things out. What's the velocity at point two up here at the top? Okay, well, we don't have to worry about Bernoulli yet. We're just looking at continuity of mass. And so the only numbers that really matter, I think for us are what the cross-sectional areas are, so what the diameter is at the two points and what the speed is at point one. And so let's get back to continuity, which is the other big equation here. We know that the velocity at point one times the cross-sectional area at point one is equal to the velocity at point two times the area at point two. And let's draw a little line here uh, for our musings about Bernoulli's equation before we start this. All right, so let's see. We know the velocity of point one. We're trying to find the velocity of point two, but let's, velocity of point one, area, pi times, we're given diameter, unfortunately. So we got to take the diameter of point one, divide it by two, and then square it. That's equal to the velocity of point two, which I'm trying to find, times pi times the diameter of point two, which we're given, divided by two, which I have to square and then multiply that by the velocity. Well, I'm not putting pi into my calculator since it's on both sides of the equation, just not. It's a waste of, uh, of, of button pushing. I also have this one half here, which is squared on both sides, so it cancels. And it seems to me, if I'm looking for the velocity at point two, I go the velocity at point one ten times the diameter squared over the diameter at point two squared. I think that works out pretty well for me. We're told that the velocity at point two from the diagram, two meters per second, 
I don't even have to convert out of centimeters here because notice I got D squared over D squared, whatever units there are for either of those, as long as they're the same, they're canceling. And so that means uh, six meters, six centimeters, even though they're gonna cancel, I still should write them correctly. Six centimeters over two centimeters. And those are both squared. Centimeter cancels, don't have to do any unit conversion there. Let's see, I got six over two, that's three, three squared is nine, nine times two, 18 meters per second. Look, I didn't even need my calculator to get that one. Okay, so that's my speed up at point two there after it's climbed 10 meters in addition to speeding up. All right, so now I got to answer that question. What pressure caused that to happen for crying out loud? All right, well, I'm going to use my initial final construct and I'm going to write them in reverse order because it always seems to me to start with initial and figure, find out what final is. So I'm going to go pressure initially at point one, okay, plus one half the density times the velocity at point one squared plus rho times g times y1, right? Put it first, but that's kinetic energy and potential energy per unit volume plus the pressure at point one at the start is equal to the pressure at point two plus one half the density times the velocity at point two squared, which we now know, plus rho times g times y2. Okay, I, I like this better. It makes more sense to me. It allows me to do some of the same things we do at um, in, in potential energy, I guess. And all I can really figure out though is the difference between P1 and P2 because I don't know what either one of them is. But I do know some other things. I know what V1 is, so I know what this term is going to be. Why not decide to let my initial height be zero? Just so I make that term go to zero, the initial kinetic, uh, the initial potential energy per unit volume go to zero. Why not? Okay, I just figured out what that speed is, so I know what that kinetic energy is, and I know this thing has climbed to ten meters because that's what the diagram tells me. So if I want to figure out what p1 minus p2 is, and it makes sense to me that p1 has to be bigger because it's pushing the fluid from left to right it would be one half the density times V1 squared brought to the other side of the equation, so it's negative, plus one half the density times the velocity of point two squared, uh, let's see, plus the density times G times Y2 squared, which makes it look a little bit more like the equation that I started with but for me, it made sense to start with initial is equal to final. All right, let's plug numbers in now. It's that time. Um, let's see. So this is, and I can even, for calculational convenience, do something like go one half. And those two things are in both equation. So why not put in 1,000 kilogram per meter cubed? and then factor it out. And I usually go the positive thing minus the negative thing. V2 was 18 meters per second, and that's squared, minus V1, which is, um, oh, let's see, what was V1? Two meters per second. I had to go back and look at my diagram to get that. Okay, so that's these two terms written, and I factored out the one half and the, and the density. And then I'm gonna add on the potential energy term, which is um, 1,000 kilogram per meter cubed times, and I got to write a little small here, 9.8 meters per second squared. Of course, I write small and it's hard to read my writing. Why don't I just start another line here? Plus 1,000 kilogram per meter cubed. G 9.8 meter per second squared, and then the additional height, 10 meters, which is what the second point 
how much higher it is than the first point. All right, well, I, I work these out separately, put in my calculator one at a time. I got 1.6 times 10 to the fifth. And notice my units. This is a meter squared per second squared in both of those apples to apples. I multiply that by a kilogram per meter cubed. I cancel one of the meters to make it per meter squared. I'm left with a kilogram meter per second squared mass times an acceleration, which is a force. So sure enough, Newton per meter squared, right? This term here is important too. It's the same term that shows up in the, in the uh, variation of pressure with depth, rho times G times a height difference, okay? And in this particular case, I went to my calculator and I got 9.8, drop my decimal point there, times 10 to the fourth. And again, that guy turns one of those into a meter squared and a kilogram times a meter per second squared is a Newton, Newton per meter squared. I'm adding apples and apples here, not apples and oranges. Both my pressures have the same units. So I'm legitimate in adding them together. When I do, I get 2.58 times 10 to the fifth. Newton per meter squared. Now, the, the thing people don't like about Pascal's, I think, is what is atmospheric pressure? Does that number make sense? It looks like an awful big number. But remember, atmospheric pressure is 101.3 kilo Pascal's or kilo Newton per meter squared. If you work that out, that's 1.013 times 10 to the fifth right? Kilo is 10 to the third plus two more decimal points there, Newton per meter squared. So if you look at this, this is like two and a half atmospheres, right? That's a legitimate number. So I, I, although it looks like a big number, hopefully it makes sense to you. And so I can put a box around it and say, yep, I could believe that two and a half atmospheres to move some, some fluid through a pipe that has to climb 10, uh, 10 feet works for me. All right, now let's go to that manometer. Okay, that manometer. And let's figure out if the manometer was filled with mercury, it says. Okay, let's read the question. If that manometer was to be filled way back here with mercury, which has a density 13.6 times 10 to the third kilogram per meter cubed. So that's 13,600 kilogram per meter cubed. 13.6 times this, the density of water. There is a, a term you'll hear people use, specific gravity is the ratio of the, something's density to that of water. The specific gravity of mercury would be 13.6. You can see why people like specific gravity because they're too lazy to write times 10 to the third kilogram per meter cubed. That's all it is. In any event, we know that number. And so the question is, if the difference in pressure right here between this side and this side is the number I just calculated, 2.58 times 10 to the fifth Newton per meter squared. How big will this height be between the two sides of the manometer that contains mercury? And mercury is sitting right here. I'm touching my screen, so I'm making it go. That area right there is mercury. And clearly the higher pressure side pushes down on it, and that's why there's a height difference. All right, so let's figure out what that height difference is. You can calibrate the manometer this way. And I think we just use the equation from Monday, pressure minus atmospheric pressure, because that's what's on the one side. It's, it's a delta P, okay? So we're gonna just understand that to mean the change in pressure, which I call the gauge pressure, is the density times G times H. Now that thing's filled with mercury. So that's 13.6 times 10 to the third um, kilogram per meter cubed. G is 9.8 meters per second squared. H is that height we're trying to measure. And we know this is equal to that number right above because that's what delta P is. And so if I put that into my calculator, I find that the height is about 1.9 meters. 
So for big pressure differences, measuring a couple atmospheres, you need a pretty big manometer, like a two meter long manometer in order to see this pressure difference. But that's that term right there, rho times G times H, which we refer to the gauge pressure, links exactly back to this device called a manometer. All right, I've talked quite a bit. I thought I'd be done earlier, uh, but here's the two problems you get to do. Okay, in this particular case, um, I think the height, we'll say just before it leaves the nozzle and just after it leaves the nozzle is ignorably small. It might go up a couple inches, but you need to figure out what's the pressure in the hose that causes a speed of 50 meters per second in the flow of the water right here. When we found the other day that in the hose, the speed is 4.5 meters per second. Okay. And so what's the pressure in the hose? And oh yeah, outside here, atmospheric pressure, right? One atmosphere. So that's the first question you've got for the break. And then the second is uh, you got a tank. Atmospheric pressure is up here. And no real speed up here, if you're concerned about that up at that point. The level isn't dropping noticeably uh, because it's such a big tank. But down here, there's some big speed, okay? And you can see also going to atmospheric pressure, right? So the pressure difference isn't an issue, but you have this height difference, which is causing a velocity. So you use Bernoulli's equation to figure out how big this velocity is coming out. Any questions? Those are your two problems for the break. I did make the, um, the mastering physics done tonight, so as not to spoil your, your, long, uh, your long break here coming up. Um, if you need more time, uh, you know, I'll, I'll ruin your break for you, but I think you wanna get the chapter 11 and 12 homework done tonight. The last homework set will be due after we get back from the break this, on fluids here. Uh, once we finish up the last topic, which is, uh, which is viscosity, that'll be due the Friday. I guess it's the reading day before exams will be our last homework. Okay. But if you need time, more time to get this done, you want to ruin your break by doing physics homework, uh, feel free to ask for more time on that. But when you come back, uh, these two problems are due Monday when we, when we get back after the break. Any questions? I'd hope to be finished a little sooner. I guess I talk a little long. Hopefully it helped you out though, because the problem I did today, it is the problem in fluids. If you can understand everything I did there, the only thing we didn't talk about was buoyancy. Hey, I hope everybody has a uh, happy and safe Thanksgiving. Um, hopefully you do get to spend it, uh, spend it with uh, family, uh, despite any regulations in any of the states you might be located in. Um, Take some time off, but don't completely give up because we got one more week when we come back and then into finals, right? Questions for me? I'll hang around here until all questions are answered. If you want to stay around and do these problems, I can do that. I'm not coming back for, um, for office hours at 1030 on a Friday. Um, but if you need me over the break and you have questions, you want to get this done, uh, feel free to give uh, send me an email and I'll, I'll, I'll open something up to talk to you. All right. Hey, have a great break, and we'll see you when we come back, uh, what, nine days from today. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Thank you. Have a good break. You too.